Okay, now you should be able to see my screen most likely. Yay, there we are. All right. So we are going to bring in the PowerPoint presentation here and get you all set up. So now we're ready to go. All right. So hi, I'm Hunter Allen, and uh, I'm really excited that you're all here, and we've been uh, really excited to make this happen for you and for everybody out there and, and using a power meter and a data acquisition device. So it's been a great, great uh, road here for many, many years. And at the same time, we've been learning a lot. So we're going to talk about the how WKO4 evolved a little bit and some of the new features in that. And then Dr. Coggin, Andy is going to give you a little insight, a little glimpse into all of the science behind it. So uh, it should be a real well-rounded introduction. Next week and every Thursday for uh, quite a while, we'll be doing a webinar. So every Thursday we'll be doing a webinar. Next, next week our webinar will be on basically how to use all of these things. So, you know, just we're not going deep into that tonight. We're just going to give you some of the highlights here. But then next week we're going to do that. We've got a tremendous amount of videos on YouTube. If you just search for Training Peaks WKO4 on YouTube, you'll see tons of videos. We've got an incredible amount of uh, user guides as well. So we've been working very hard to make this a nice and easy transition up to our new version of WKO. So that's where we are. So we also know that many of you are on different time zones and uh, we'll be doing uh, webinars during the day and in the evening to make sure that each of you get a chance to watch them. So don't worry about that. Watch, we'll, we'll keep you updated and we'll send out some emails to make sure that you get on those webinars. Okay, so let's get started here and talk a little bit about why we created WKO4. Well, we thought we had a data challenge, um, and we did. Uh, all of the, the team at Training Peaks came to us and said, hey, you guys, you know, you guys have been leading the, the power training world for so many years with WKO. What can you do next? How can we make this happen? How can we make it better? What can we do? So we got, uh, we kind of did a little think tank. We did a lot of meetings. We had lots of fun. We had lots of whiteboards and uh, lots of notes and lots of uh, crumpled up paper. At the same time, we came out with some, uh, some really exciting ideas. And ultimately, in our discovery, well, what we were thinking was we found out that really the data itself is evolving. Okay, so that's something that has been uh, really happening over the last 10, 12 years now since we've been doing this. You know, we have an increase in the data itself, you know, more channels. You know, now we've got GPS, now we've got left and right power data. Uh, we've got tons of different devices. Uh, it seems like there's a new power meter coming out every week, practically. Uh, so it's really incredible the amount of evolution that's occurring. Not only that, we have more data sources that are, uh, you know, we have that are collecting. So, you know, all of a sudden we found that maybe it's not all just about power. There's a lot of other ones out there as well that are uh, coming out. So that was a very interesting insight. And then there are a lot of trends, the trends towards really getting deeper with this data, going down to a really granular level. How far can we go down the rabbit hole? Uh, and that's something that uh, ultimately we started to look into as well. So we are really evolving this. And that's what we're seeing is this data itself is evolving. Well, the problem then really is that analytics aren't. The reality is we have a lot of data, okay, but very true, few true analytics. And what is analytics ultimately? Well, you know, that's like... Tra training stress score and normalized power, uh, we those kind of things, they're really analytics to understand really that information. So that's really where that hasn't evolved. I mean, we haven't really been able to do anything with that in the past you know, five, six, seven years. And so that's ultimately the, the challenge. Well, we've been focusing on 
really what happened, okay? And that's really been what we've been, been doing now for many, many years. What really happened? We've got this amazing data that comes out of power meters, and we, we get all these streams of channels and lines and graphs and bar charts and things, and that's really been focusing on what happened. But ever since the beginning of, of the start of this back in 2000, 2001, 2002, we really wanted to know why it happened. What are the correlations? What are the things that are causing it to happen? And so ultimately, we actually have an analytics challenge. Okay, so that's really what our challenge is. We didn't really have a data challenge. We got plenty of that. We have an analytics challenge. So let's think about how this progresses. In analytics, first off, you have information and what happened, right? The descriptive analytics. Okay? That's the things that are, you know, what we've been looking at for a long time. Then we're moving towards this idea of why did it happen, more diagnostic analytics. From there, we come to a place, well, what will happen? A predictive analytic. And then as we get further optimized, now we actually have to say, well, how can we make it happen? Can we prescribe our analytics and create prescriptive analytics? When we think about this, it's really hindsight, insight, and then foresight. So that's ultimately what we were looking at. You know, it's been very interesting thinking about this because the uh, business world has been doing this kind of prescriptive analytics and predictive analytics for many, many years. Uh, they've, you know, SAP, SAS, all these companies, their software costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and does these uh, kinds of predictive and prescriptive analytics. It gives high value and unfortunately it is difficult. As we move for farther and farther towards the optimization, the value becomes higher, but we also become, becomes more challenging. So we're stuck right here, okay? So that's where we are. We've been that way for a while, and that's been a challenge. You know, the business world's moved on. Lots of other different worlds has moved on, but in the endurance world, it really hasn't moved on. So what if I told you there was a way to evolve endurance analytics? Okay. So here we're taking it into this what happened, why did it happen, into more of what will happen, okay? And this is really, again, how to get you there, all right? And that's really what we're thinking about is how can we make this happen? And ultimately, again, there is nothing in this endurance world that did this, all right? We, there was no, there's no solution. And ultimately, that's what we did. The challenge became not just a data challenge because the data was always there, but an analytical challenge. So WK04, is the first analytical engine ever created specifically for endurance sports. So that's really what we've done here. Why do you need an analytical engine? What do you do with it? How do you use it, right? That's the next thing. How do we use this? Well, it's an answer to a question that you didn't really know you even had, right? Well, you didn't even know you needed an analytics engine. You didn't really know about the fact that you wanted an iPhone until you saw people with iPhones. And then you said, oh, I got to have one of those, right? Or I got to have this smartphone. That's really cool. Well, it's an insight accelerator, right? It helps you understand more about yourself and others. It's a problem solver. Ultimately, you're, we're solving problems. You're solving problems. We're trying to understand deeper about you as an individual and also even if you're a coach as well. Well, you're probably saying, Hunter, that sounds great, but can you really prove it? Can you really do anything here? Just tell me, what, what's, what does all this mean? What are some of the problems? Well, let's look at some of these problems. So WKO solves just, and these are just a few, all right, that I want to go for because I, we've got, we don't have all day to talk about this, and you certainly don't want to listen to me all day, but let's, let's, let's talk about four of them. Generalization of training standards and metrics. That's been always a problem. 
It's been a problem that we didn't have a highly accurate way of estimating key data and metrics without lab testing. All right, so we're just trying to work, we're building that in. An inability to develop custom analytics. Let's say, for example, you would like to come up with something you have a theory about yourself and you want to come up with some new Joe index or Bob index, whatever that is, you can, there's no way to actually do that and no way for anybody to do that. And there's a lack of a complete solution. I mean, it has been so many times where I've got six or seven different programs open and I can't, I'm moving between them and so many different tools and, can, you know, and it's just, it's just a challenge. There hasn't been a great workflow yet. So as we go through here, one of these problems that we, we had to identify was, is the fact that most endurance training metrics are based off of a bell curve. What does that look like? And how do we get to the individualized training itself? Well, there's your standard bell curve. I think you've all remember that and what that looks like. And here we see kind of this general, you know, functional rules work well, right? So most, a lot of people fit in here, right? Then we have some outliers here, customization needed here, customization needed there. And ultimately, there is improvement still possible around um, among all of this area, right? So we want to improve not just the outlier parts of your training, but all over that entire bell curve. However, we had to really figure out where and how do we do that for you individually. So individualization, training that recognizes a, your unique physiology. Okay, that's ultimately what we're talking about here. We're trying to uh, uh, find out what is what is the thing that you are needed. You know, it's a it's a focused diagnostic analysis. You know, it's the diagnosis. You know, just like if a doctor would diagnose you, right? We're trying to understand what that means and then prescribe training, but do it in an individual way that is just for you to improve your training efficiency and effectiveness. So that's what we're talking about and we're, how we're moving in that direction. So let's, let's, let's go in here and, and do just a little demo in WKO4 on individualized performance and how that works. Okay. So here we have WKO4, and this is just a, uh, the athlete details pack at the top for an athlete that I work with. And so not super interesting just from a, a color perspective here, but this is your basics in here where your name is and some of the things that your weight and all these things are in here. One thing that's very interesting is here is we now have Coggin individualized power levels. And we've been using Coggin classic levels now for many, many years. And again, they fit under the bell curve, right? They've been great for a lot of people. We've designed training plans. We've designed all kinds of things around these. They've worked very, very well. But as we've evolved and the data has evolved, our analytics has evolved as well. So we have now individualized levels for each athlete. So just putting your data in here, you get a individualized training level just made for you. So that's, that's a real change because we've, we've seen over the years that not everybody fits there and how do we know when we're training in, again, the right zone for me specifically. So I know that now for that one. So let's think about as well, let's look at the, the different athletes that we have. Okay, so now we're looking at the dashboard here for WKO4 and you'll notice on the left-hand explorer I have lots of different athletes in here. And one thing that you'll notice right away is you'll see that each athlete has a phenotype, a time trialist, an all-rounder, more time trialist, all-rounder, I have a sprinter down here. So there, there are four different phenotypes and that shows us a little bit about each one. Okay, so that's one that we're looking at as well. Now, the other thing that is interesting in here is we have lots of historical metrics. Okay, so if we look at one of the, um, just what we call these as chart packs, we have 
a parent chart up here and we have the children charts down below and they just you know you can click on them and, and you can walk through these right and you can see a little bit about how this historical data works so this athletes mean maximal power curve right here and we can use this right hand explorer on this side and I'll just kind of move this over here so you can see it a little bit better and hold the command button down and it will compare these things together so I'll show you a little bit about this as we go but this historical data is a great way to start looking at that also now another thing that is interesting when we look at this information from an individualized level and we'll look in here to uh, just a single file this is an interesting one here from the perspective of looking at uh, what's that one right there looking at a race okay so here we have Marcos did a, a race most recently this past weekend uh, was very successful in that race and won this race he went in, he was in this area here he did lots of attacking then was in a breakaway a two-man breakaway all the way to the finish now one thing that you'll notice here is you'll notice that his heart rate goes down his cadence changes his speed changes his power goes down but you can see here that as his cadence starts going down as he gets fatigued then at this point around two hours and 30 minutes or so his cadence comes back up and it comes back up keeps coming all the way to around three hours and then at three hours it drops off so that's interesting to see how this this cadence starts keeping dropping off but then it comes back up so for me I started to think about well gosh what does that mean for Marcos how do I understand this a little bit better especially since this is uh, uh, clearly we all know for you know from looking at our power data that over time you know as you fatigue your cadence gets a little bit slower etc so I started to build a couple of charts here just to look at this so one chart that I built in this uh, chart pan in this area here was a cadence chart, average power by cadence in lanes. This is what we call the lanes view. Here's a lane, here's a lane, here's a lane. So here is all of the data from 40 to 60. Now yeah, there's nothing, not, he really didn't pedal there any time between 40 and 60. We got a few little blips here from 61 to 70. We got some more blips here from 71 to 80. And then as we come down, we see that from 81 to 90, we see some more blips as well, starting to get a little more concentrated in this area right here. So as he gets fatigued, right, we saw that right up to 230, he started to, his cadence really reduced, right? And you can see down here, 91 to 100 is where most of the time he spent pedaling, right? When we come down to 101 plus, these are all the attacks. You can see when he did attacks in the beginning of the race right here, hard accelerations. And way over here at the very end, the finishing sprint, he had a little blip right here. But what's been, what's really interesting is, look at this cluster of cadence between 91 and 100, right there at that two and a half to three hour mark. All right, so here's where he shifted from pedaling relatively slow into pedaling faster at this point in the race. So... From that perspective, you know, it started to say, hmm, well, that's that's the individual nature of Marcos, what he does when he starts to get fatigued. So we need to dig just a little bit deeper there. So I created another chart here, very simple. And again, these are charts that we have on, we'll have on the chart exchange and uh, we can just, you know, send these charts to you. It's so simple to just send them to you. Literally, I can click the down arrow here and say ex export. I can email a chart to anybody and all my friends, and then you just drag and drop it right onto your software, right onto your WKO4. So that's the great thing here is that so many people can build these amazing charts, but ultimately you don't really have to spend tons of time doing them because the community is going to build great charts for you. So here we see now, well, how much when he was spent when he was doing 71 to 80 RPMs. Where was his power? And where was 81 to 90 and 91 to 100? And then we know, okay, well, gosh, every time he's over 101, his power is much higher at 350 or plus. And that, again, that's his sprinting time. 
So that's really, you know, helps us to give us more insight into his individual nature about cadence. And now I can individualize his training even more, especially for that. Well, that these are great and pretty sometimes, but sometimes I like to look at them in just the raw numbers as well. So I click on configure here, come down to chart type, and it's the chart. Our type can be a chart or a report. And I'll just click the report button and it flips automatically to giving the metrics for those bins. And we know right there, 91 to 100, 268 watts, 81 to 90, 254. So that's an easy way to kind of just play with some of this data and how you want to, want to make it look for your customization, for your individualization as well. So a simple and easy one to do. All right, so let's kind of come back here to uh, our PowerPoint and talk a little bit more about what that what, what's next in terms of solving these um, individual what's our next problem our next problem really is we lack highly accurate and granular data granular level data needed to do these advanced predictive analytics so that's been a that's that's been a real challenge. We've spent lots of time of, about this, and Dr. Coggins is going to talk here in just a few minutes about that. Um, so, we needed a power duration model. Right? We needed to be predictive. Well, predictive models exploit patterns found in data to identify risks, opportunities, and risks. Models capture the relationships amount of many factors to allow assessment of risk or potential associated with a particular set of conditions guiding and supporting the decision making for training you know these are what predictive models do so what happens if we add the world's most accurate human performance model ever created to our high power analytical engine we get the ability to do predictive analytics so let's talk a little bit about what our power duration metrics are. In our power duration metrics here, let me look go over to another athlete here. I'm going to give you a two different athletes to that are, are pretty different, but to give you a little bit of uh, an understanding about these, we're going to look at one here. We've got. I'll bring back my right hand explorer there. And we'll look up here at our power duration curve pack. That's the default pack there. And if you'll notice over here on the right hand side, and I'll get rid of that, um, I'll make that just a little bit bigger here so you can see, we have our date ranges over here. So this athlete, you can see that this is their power duration curve right here. The yellow is their mean maximal power. You're used to seeing that, have seen that for many, many times. And the red is that power duration curve. So you'll notice that he is absolutely not a sprinter, and our phenotype is telling us he's a T tier, and he does not have any kind of a sprint at all, and not much in the anaerobic ability there, all the way out to a minute. And then he starts to cross over some of these lines, getting all the way out to very good around 20 minutes or so and 40 minutes. Okay, so this is a, a great way to kind of understand what that, what that, how his strengths and weaknesses are. And then I can make some predictions about what he's going to do and in efforts and pacing and races, um, lots of different uh, ideas from there. Let's look at his history in terms of his metrics. And I'm going to make this one large here so you can see it really easily. And what we see here at the top, and again, Andy's going to talk about this. The pink one is Pmax, or Power Max. And you can see how his Pmax has changed over time. Okay, this is 2015. And then you can see the green here, his functional reserve capacity, how this has changed over time. And you can see also how his FTP, his modeled FTP, has changed as well. So I'm going to bring all this back here, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go down to the bottom here, and let's click on all workouts, and you can see all of his workouts, and I'll bring this up for all of his time since he got a power meter back in 
2013, April, and you can see how his FTP has dramatically changed. So here we have 2013, 2014, and 240, 240, 240, 240. All of a sudden, it starts going up to 50, to 55, to 70, to 76. Really starts to make some gains. All, right? all the way to 279, 281 watts uh, in April of this year. So literally, two years later, he goes from 220 watts to 280 watts. So looking at that and how those, those change. Okay, let's look at a different athlete now. We'll look at Miguel. Miguel is another athlete that I work with. We'll look at his power duration curve. And his power duration curve is very different than Scott's. Now you can see that he is almost excellent in sprinting, right? very, very close. And then he's very, very good, exceptional, out here in anaerobic capacity, or FRC. And then out here, we can see that he stays exceptional all the way out to an hour. And that's why he's an all-arounder. Miguel's racing in the, the Pan, Amer Pan, Pan Am Games here this weekend. He's a professional cyclist, and this shows us a lot about what he does. Now, at the same time, it gives me greater insight into how to predict what he's done, and that way I can see what he's been, what he can do well in, and also determine how he's going to improve uh, over time. So this is a great one that I've been looking at as well. Okay, so that's just a little bit about our our, our history here. We'll we'll see his his p uh, his PD history, his power duration curve history, and. He's been doing, he's got a great sprint. He's been, he's incredible at sprinting. Here, I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. Uh, his Pmax is very high. His FRC is very high. And it has, uh, and it's, it's in this range right now. So he's very, very set for this weekend. I think he'll have a good race this weekend. So again, we're kind of getting back, getting off track just a little bit. I'm going to let Andy talk about that even more as we go uh, further down this idea. And let's come back and let's talk a little bit about what our next one is. Our next one is really been the problem that we've had to solve is the inability to build custom analytics. How do we get that? And so ultimately our, our analytics engine has is the answer. Pedaling, for example. We've had pedaling data now for a couple of years. Uh, but very limited analytics. Nobody really has known what to do with this data or, or uh, how to look at it or how to, how to uh, do anything with it. What does it mean? Is it helpful or is it not helpful? So that's one of, been one of our challenges that we've been working on as well. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So we'll go up here and I'll show you a little bit of data from, uh, from my uh, experience. So I've, I've done a lot of riding with my uh, left and right power meters over the, over the past year or two, gathering plenty of data. Here's a ride that I did back in September. And you can see here is just your power right here. So you've got both the right leg and left leg power. So here's power. When you hover over the channels at the top, you can isolate just those channels, left leg power, right leg power, heart rate, cadence, speed, elevation. As you go farther to the right here, we got left effectiveness, right, right effectiveness, all kinds of information in here. So what we've done here is we've been working very hard on lots of these analytics. So uh, we've come up with one that you will be very interested in, and it's called gross power released and gross power absorbed. So I'm going to make this one big for you here. We'll bring in that right hand explorer just so we can compare some intervals. What we have here on the on the in the blue is our gross power released. This is an, a five minute interval that I did and uh, what I did here was in order to just learn more about this, see what my left leg was doing, what my right leg was doing, and down in the bottom we have the gross power absorbed. So the red is the gross power released on the right, the blue is the red is the left gross power released. Down here at the bottom we have gross power absorbed. Because you release power, but then also you can absorb power. And 
if your absorption rate is too high, you might be offsetting a lot of the releasing power. So one that I like to look at here is that mean maximal curve. And you can see right away that when this interval was done all standing, so I was standing the entire time. When I'm standing, my left leg is releasing more power than my right leg is. And notice here at the bottom, my right leg is absorbing more power than my left leg is. Now, if I come down to the next interval here, I'll click, I'll click on the next lap. And we got a little crash there. That happens sometimes. We're still beta testing a, uh, a little bug there that I'm chasing, so that happens sometimes. Let's come over here. We'll get to that one, and we'll come down to the second interval there. Ah, it doesn't like that interval. Well, maybe we won't show that interval. But I think you get the idea here. We've got our ant plus uh, balance scatter plot there, and then we've got the infamous Zorro chart. So more analytics to help you uh, understand your left, right power data. So we're, we're gonna have a whole webinar just on pedaling coming up. Don't worry, I've written a bunch of articles as well and we've got all kinds of terms for you guys to learn uh, over the coming months. So it's gonna be a great journey there. All right. Let's come back and we'll come to our PowerPoint again here. We've got one more to talk about here and give you a little bit of information on what about our final problem. There's no total solution here. And that's been something that we've been struggling with for a long time. Training Peaks and WKO4 is now the answer. It's seamlessly integrated to each other. Okay, so now you have a Training Peaks account that is a seamless sync into Training Peaks and WKO4. WKO4 then has endurance analytics and analysis, and then back to Training Peaks, that seamless sync happening all the time. This has really made life easier and is going to make life a lot easier for many, many of you. So I'm really excited about this part of it. This is, as we look through that workflow, it is a challenge many times, especially in a lot of the things that we do. All right, over to WKO4 again. So one of these things that we'll like to, to show you here in this is our hero bar. Okay, so at the top we've got our hero bar, and we'll come down here to Marcos again. And we've got these metrics across the top. Okay, and that's really what we call our hero bar there. I'll click on his last 90 days here. And you see the CTL is right here. The ATL is right here. His training stress balance is here. His ramp rate is right here. And Pmax, FRC, modeled FTP, and set FTP. Okay, so we're able to, WKO4 can uh, actually figure out your FTP, highly accurate and then you have the place to set the FTP as well. So you can say, well, you know, it's, it's here, it's there, within five watts, 10 watts or so. And Marcos is within one watt right here. So really, really close to what Marcos, what I believe it is, is his coach. Now, if you notice here, if you hover over the hero metrics, you can click on these and change these. So anything within WKO that, is, uh, that highlights when you click over it, that's clickable. Okay, so anything in here you see that's highlighted that, that you can click on. So just a little way to, to think about that. Now, check out here what we'll do here. We've got the mean maximal power curve. And one of the things that we'll, uh, we can do, again, I've already showed you one of these. We can use this right-hand explorer to just click and move between our different time ranges here. And I can command click on it and go to 2014. I can go to 2013, and that way you can see all kinds of data in here uh, compared to each other. So that's a real simple way to, to you know, work through this workflow of that. You know, one thing that we found in WKO3 that everybody was doing was that they were creating the same chart, the same PMC, but 10 or 15 different times because they had 2015, 2014, they had 
the base period for each year. They had March for each year. And so they were just scrolling through all these crazy um, different charts, but they're all the same chart. So now all you have to do, if you want to just see the last 30 days, just click on it and you get the last 30 days. Okay. If you want to see multiple ranges, you can do that. If you'd like to just see uh, your mountain biking, then up here in the right hand explorer, you can see the mountain biking. Okay. Or if you'd like to see running, you can just see running. If you want to see cycling, you can just see cycling. So you can, you can filter out that data really simply right there. You can make a new range, right? So maybe you want to make a new range and you hit the plus button down here and you say, oh gosh, you know, I'd really like to see March to May 2015. And then I would just change the, the date right here. So we can just do three, one, two, May, one. Create a custom range inside here. That way we've got our own custom range right here. Then I could do it for 2014 and I can compare those things together. So very simple and easily to do that. All right. That's been a big change. I know that's a big change for those of you who have been using WKO3 for a long time. But once you get this, you can kind of see how that works. Now, let me show you here. We'll look at uh, Scott's data one more time. And then I think I'm going to hand it over to Andy and uh, let him give you all the science background on here because that's uh, really exciting stuff as well. One thing here that will be interesting to look at here, we'll look at Scott's data and we've got uh, three years of data. I'm just going to click on the command, hold down the command button and hold down the uh, and click on the previous year. That PMC gets kind of busy right there. Okay, so that's hard to see. Well, what if I just change that a little bit. I'm going to configure it, click on the configure button, and I'm going to take that data series and I'm going to zoom and separate that data series. So now what I've done is I've separated out the chronic training load. So now I can see all three years, the TSB, the ATL, the peaks for each one, and the set FTP. So a simple and easy way to just overlay these things on top of each other Maybe I just want to see 2015 and 2013. I can just hit the command button and click on the one I don't want, and now I've got those things overlaid. Or maybe I really want to just see 2013 and 2014. However you want to do this compare, you can easily do that. So the other thing that I want to show you is under the Athlete Details tab. So up here at the Chart Picker, this left uh, icon right there that brings up your chart picker. We're going to bring up Scott's athlete details pack. I'll double click on his details pack here. All right, so that's the one I showed you earlier this year. Is what we can do here is we click on this and we can edit this data. All right, so we can edit this data out. Now you can put in your username and password right here. So if we put in a username and password, I'm not going to do all of it, but I'll put in the username and password. It will log on to Training Peaks, make sure your account is correct, and then would sync that data. Okay, so then that way I can tell it to sync that data every hour, however you like it. Okay, so when we up here under the preferences button, and I'm going to go way up here in the right hand corner, there's a little uh, wheel up here, and there's a preferences button there under that preferences then you can choose how you'd like to sync with Training Peaks when it starts, every hour, or manually. Uh, so that way you can choose it. I usually have it every hour, so that way I can get my data pulling down. My athletes are all over the world. It gives me a chance to do that. At the same time, if you're a coached athlete, you're pushing up data every, you know, every time you, that you sync. So really seamless and great workflow play with. So a big change here in terms of, of uh, how our workflow goes, but at the same time, I think you can see the power of, of having that ability to configure and work within that. Okay, we'll put that one back the way we had it before. We've got our two years over top, and then there's the 2015 back to the way we are. So highly configurable and easy workflow. All right. Well, I think that's it for me for a little bit. We're going to give it over to Andy here. 
and uh, give us a second here, and we'll get his screen up and running, and uh, we'll be we'll listen to how all of the science comes together. Can hear me now. And yep, I can hear uh, you. There was a request. I can Good. hear you. Thank you. All right. There, there was a request that uh, we move a Muted. slowly so that the internet can keep up with us, which will be difficult for me to do. But <laughs> um, I will uh, do my best not to jump back and forth between slides too rapidly. Uh, tonight, I was just going to talk about the power duration model that's within WKO4, in particular how it has been uh, vetted, I guess you would say, uh, to make sure that we have the most robust possible approach to utilize. And then I've got uh, a number of uh, screen captures from WKO4, since I'm a, a PC person, I'm running on a PC right here. Um, uh, some screen captures from WKO4 that I can show you different features and that kind of thing. Uh, what I want to say at the outset, though, is that there's a, a learning process here. It's not really a steep learning curve because, for the most part, the concepts aren't that difficult to grasp. Uh, and we have my software now to do all the heavy lifting for us. I think it's a case where there are just so many possible applications of... Uh, not only the model we'll talk about, but as Hunter was showing with the ability to create your own custom charts, et cetera, that actually, you know, the, the limitless ability is kind of mind boggling at times. Um, but hopefully we can give you a little bit of flavor for that tonight. All right, so um, you might ask yourself, did I skip a slide here? Um, Slow to respond. You know, why, why would you choose to try and model the power duration relationship uh, and bring out the heavy guns of statistical tools in order to look at uh, mean maximal power data? And quite a few people seem to be under the misconception, well, the purpose is to predict power at various durations. Uh, but, but from where I sit, that's really the wrong answer. Uh, and not only just from where I sit, because when I first proposed it, uh, some very smart people also asked the same thing. And they said, well, we're already collecting enough data that we can reconstruct a nice mean maximal power chart. You know, why do you need a smooth line to go through all of these data points? Um, and the, the, real, the reason that you need that is because the goal is not to predict power. Uh, if you really want to know how much power you can make for a particular duration, the best way to find out is to do a formal test, i.e. the best predictor of performance is performance itself. And I don't think there's any better example of that than uh, recently when Bradley Wiggins was going after the hour record. Did he rely on the predictions of a mathematical model to try and figure out his target distance? No. He went and he did extended efforts on the velodrome, I think at least up to 40 minutes long, and then he still had to adopt on the, or adapt on the fly during the day based on you know, environmental conditions and that kind of thing. Um, so when you consider that you know, how relatively easy it is to collect that kind of information, that the best predictor of performance is performance itself, uh, the uh, motivation for trying to apply a mathematical model and then you know interpolate or extrapolate power some becomes quite a bit more uh, more limited. The real reason to choose to model the power duration relationship because it lets us do two things. Uh, first off, if we have a good robust mathematical model, uh, we can get quantitative insight into people's unique abilities, and this is what Hunter was talking about. Uh, their physiology as expressed in terms of their power output without having resort to laboratory-based testing, which is not accessible to all that many people. Uh, and then secondly, by using the uh, mathematical description of the power duration relationship as the basis for uh, further calculations, because that mathematical description is based upon all of the available data, uh, it tends to be much more stable and robust, and therefore uh, provides you a, a, a solid foundation on which to make additional uh, uh, 
calculations. And as I talked about in the original uh, webinars way back in 2013, um, you know, the one way to look at it is that the power duration model is down here. It's the foundation of what I call my Parthenon figure, where the goal is to support a new, more individualized approach to power-based training. Or as I was sitting through a, a talk today and I saw one of the questioners had the same kind of thing, uh, in medicine, uh, the future is in precision medicine. And so NIH has an entire uh, precision medicine approach where everything is individualized based on, in part, analytics. Uh, so the, uh, the pillars here are various applications of the model. These are not uh, the only possible uses for it, as uh, I'll uh, show a couple examples that aren't pillars here. Uh, those that are in bold are already been implemented. Uh, those that aren't are, you know, for the future. But because of the ability to write expressions and create new charts, um, there are things that you can add without that. I hadn't even anticipated at the time I originally made this figure, which somebody pointed out the Parthenon has eight pillars and they said the Temple of Zeus has six pillars. So this, I guess, is the Temple of Zeus, not the Parthenon. So just very quickly, and again, uh, a lot of this is uh, carryover from the uh, um, original webinars. If uh, people want to know more details, you can always go and, and view those. Uh, the only thing that's really changed is we've continued to expand the database. Uh, I've now been beating on this model. It was originally conceived in the summer of 2012. Uh, and so now our database of evaluation is up to over 200 season athletes, ranging from uh, you know, weekend warriors to uh, people who are currently, uh, well, I won't say, uh, world champions, grand tour winners, that kind of thing. So quite a range, both men and women, of, uh, although, of course, you know, reflecting the sport, perhaps, or at least the power meeting, meter using aspect of the sport, it's biased toward men. So if there are any women who want to contribute data for analysis, you know, I'm always interested in looking at more numbers. So uh, summer of 2012. Uh, looking around saying, okay, we need the foundation for our uh, uh, power meter equivalent to pre precision-based medicine. Uh, the only way to do that is to uh, have a mathematical model of the power duration relationship. Uh, I investigated the scientific literature and it quickly became clear that all of the models that have been proposed to date were either uh, over-parameterized, they were conceptually incorrect in terms of how the physiology was incorporated into the math, uh, or they uh, um, <coughs> simply didn't uh, cover a, a wide enough range of durations. Uh, to be fully useful for our purposes. That is, their domain of validity was too narrow. And the classic example might be the critical power, the original critical power uh, paradigm, where you might be able to fit it for our data that goes from, you know, 100 to 1,000 seconds or from 200 to 2,000 seconds, but only over about, you know, one order of magnitude. Whereas if you have people like, you know, some of these 24-hour and longer mountain bike riders, you have, you know, tens of thousands of seconds worth of data that you need to think about. So it became clear that it was necessary to, you know, come up with uh, uh, my own model, and therefore I approached it just like uh, we do at work with respect to evaluating mathematical models. And there's a lot of different uh, uh, aspects you need to take into consider uh, and ways of uh, evaluating them uh, as listed on this screen. Uh, it's certainly far more complicated than, you know, just grabbing eight subjects and saying, here's the equation and, you know, uh, solving for the results and throwing up an R squared value and say, okay, I'm done. Uh, no, it's much more complicated than that. Um, so, like I said, I've been beating on this thing for three years. It's passed every stress test I can possibly give it. And so just to try and show you the, the results in uh, a very quick period of time, um, is what I'm going to try and do next. But before I do so, I realized we need to define some terms here. The, the three parameters of the model that we're reporting, at least for now, are Pmax, the maximal power that you can generate for a short period as a, uh, like I said, a, uh, an expression of the physiological trait. You might describe it as neuromuscular power. Um, 
functional reserve capacity, which is the total amount of work that can be done during continuous exercise above FTP before fatigue ensues, and then functional threshold power, which now has been around for uh, over a decade, uh, but it's really the functional uh, equivalent or expression of your, really your metabolic control limit uh, in terms of power output. Uh, so those are the parameters that we're going to be taking a look at here. Now, in terms of uh, evaluating models, analyzing the residuals, that is the difference between the predicted and observed values is a, is a very important part of that. Uh, and quite often you normalize them, that is you express it as a percentage. Uh, so in a perfect model, in an ideal model, your model is unbiased. And that is, while it may sometimes miss a little high or sometimes miss a little low, uh, on average, it should be centered on uh, you know, a direct hit or a 0% error and be normally distributed around that. So here's a bar graph of the distribution of the residuals. The WKO4 model is applied to this database, like I said, of nearly 200 season athletes. And as you can see, it's a nice Gauss Gaussian. Gaussian? Yeah. Gaussian shaped curve centered on 0% uh, with the mean absolute error, that is ignoring whether it's high or low and just talking about uh, magnitude uh, of 3.2% plus or minus 2.8%. Now another important aspect of looking at the residuals is uh, how they fall out with respect to uh, your predictor variable, if you will. In this case, it's the duration of the effort. And so you can see here from one second all the way out to 100,000 seconds that the uh, <coughs> normalized residuals, the average normalized residual comes very close to that 0% line and the 95% confidence intervals overlap 0% from, like I said, over six orders of magnitude time here. Uh, so no bias in the model whatsoever. Uh, the reason things kind of blow up out there beyond 10,000 seconds or so is that that's getting out to be five and six and plus hour rides and the number of uh, individuals who, you know, ride their bikes that long becomes less and less and less. So the sample size is decreasing at very long durations, so it gets kind of noisy out there. Um, so no bias there. Another important aspect of models is that if, uh, if your model is over-parameterized, that is you're trying to, you know, uh, put too many uh, descriptor terms into your model, uh, you can always make the curve bend around a little bit more and fit the data better or more closely, but the problem becomes is that then your parameter estimates become intertwined. You're really, what you're, what you're doing is you're using uh, multiple things to represent, which is really just one thing, and therefore it can become really hard to tease apart those, uh, those parameters. And yet you can see here that the correlation, for example, between, uh, or the R-square between Pmax and FRC is only 0.52. The correlation between Pmax and FTP is even lower. And there is zero, you know, essentially zero correlation between FRC and FTP. Uh, so we have independent parameters here, especially when you consider I'm dealing with the data here in absolute watts, uh, not normalized to body mass. So you might think, well, you know, if you're a big person with a lot of fast twitch fibers, you're going to have a high Pmax in watts, but because large muscle mass and fast twitch fibers contributes to a high functional reserve capacity, you'd also have a high FRC. So some of the association here is, is really to be expected from a physiological perspective. Uh, but nonetheless, these are, these are uh, clearly well independent and you don't get the tight correlations that often uh, can be a problem in a model that's over-parameterized. Uh, as well, uh, this is what the uh, Ikeki Information Criterion, or AIC, allows you to do. You evaluate different models and models that have uh, more parameters are penalized compared to models that have fewer parameters. And at least from uh, probability uh, theory, you end up sorting out to the, the minimal model that best uh, describes your data, or the model with the minimal number of parameters. And because the parameter estimates are not intertwined, because the residuals are normally distributed, because the uh, magnitudes of the residuals are, are small, uh, what the, the consequence is that the, the fitted parameters uh, are arrived at with uh, uh, adequate precision and hence confidence. 
Uh, so this is the coefficient of variation or really the uncertainty uh, of on average of all of those 200 season athletes for the fitted values for Pmax, FRC, and FTP. Now it should be pointed out that these are uh, these estimates uh, would be asymptotically correct only, and that is only if you had an infinitely large sample size. And they're dependent upon the assumption, in part, that you know all of the data is independent, which clearly isn't the truth from a mean maximal power curve. You know, if you set your best 59-second effort on one day, it's quite likely that your best 60-second effort will also have occurred on that same day. Yet we have really no choice but to treat the numbers as if they're independent. And as a result, uh, we end up uh, you would tend to overestimate the precision of these uh, these model fit parameters. Uh, but nonetheless, it's recognized that they're only correct asymptotically and it's standard to report them uh, because it gives you an, a feel, even if it's not uh, absolutely correct, it nonetheless gives you a feel for, well, how well are you extracting this information that you want to extract because this is uh, a good part of what we're after here. Um, and you can see we're pulling out the FTP within, you know, with 1% confidence, uh, FRC 1.5%, Pmax a little less so because Pmax is uh, down at the very short end of the curve and different time durations exert different amounts of leverage on the model fit. So the Pmax value is really defined by maybe the first 10 seconds worth of data. Uh, so there's not a lot of numbers that are contributing to it. Yeah, everything out there, you know, all the way out to the far right tail does have an influence, but it becomes infinitesimal uh, at long durations. And then finally, the most important aspect of model validation actually comes down to uh, comparing it to a gold standard external validation. And this is a lot of what we've done up at, uh, up at work for a, a decade or so, um, comparing uh, pet-derived mathematical models of cardiac metabolism to direct measurements in order to validate the model. Now, it would be interesting to validate the WKO4 model against various physiological measurements, for example, to compare the model-derived FTP against power at maximal lactate steady state, uh, et cetera. But, you know, uh, not what I do for a living, so don't have that ability. Uh, as well, you kind of have to think about, well, you know, what is a gold standard for something like the functional reserve capacity? Uh, it's the closest surrogate might be maximal accumulated O2 deficit, but maximal accumulated O2 deficit or MAOD is entirely non-aerobic in nature, whereas there is a, an aerobic component to FRC. So not quite the same thing. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, it's not enough to sit there and say, hey, we have a model here, it spits out numbers. You have to evaluate them and you have to validate them somehow. So I've relied upon other uh, ways of trying to estimate the same physiological traits. Um, as shown in this slide here, for example, comparing the model-derived Pmax to simply your maximal one-second power. And, yeah. Very nice correlation between the two. Uh, slope is very close to 1.0, and, and therefore, if you do a Bland-Altman uh, and you compare the difference between uh, the two measurements to the average of the two measurements, you can see that the mean value comes very close to 0%. That is, you know, they yield the same answer on average, and it also shows you the, uh, the average uh, deviation between them. Actually, I'd be 95% confidence limits there. Did since I put 1.96 standard deviations. Um, so they're going to have that degree of agreement uh, on average. As an aside, uh, one of the nice things about having a model in this context is when you see your, your large deviation between your measured one second or two second or three second power and what the model is saying, it's uh, the vast majority of the time it's a sign that your, your short duration power spit out by your power meter is bogus. You know, your SRM double trip the cadence meter or there's a spike in torque for whatever reason. Uh, but power, uh, muscle power, while it drops off pretty quickly, is nonetheless uh, only falling a little bit in the first, say, five seconds of exercise. So when you plot things against a log x-axis, you should say, see a bit of a shelf over there at the far left side. Um, and if you don't and it doesn't agree with the model, then you need to be going in and looking at your raw data. As I said, it's a little bit more difficult to compare uh, 
FRC against things, but just for fun, grins and giggles, um, I decided I would compare it to the classic Wingate test, which is really sort of neither here nor there. Uh, it's neither fully aerobic nor is it fully non-aerobic. In fact, there's really no duration that is entirely one or the other. Uh, and it's not the duration that exerts the greatest leverage or has the highest correlation with FRC. Uh, on average, uh, that's more out around 47 seconds, as I recall. Um, but I use 30 seconds because most people are familiar with the Wingate test as a measure of, you know, your resistance to fatigue during very high intensity, non-sustainable exercise. And you can see, yeah, there's a good correlation between the model-derived FRC and, and 30 second power. And of course, since they're different units, you can't really do a bland Altman since they're measuring different things, work and power. Um, here is the model-derived FTP compared to uh, Hunter's classic approach, which is to use 95% of 20-minute power. And again, you can see a tight R squared, slope exactly 1.0. So on average, they give you the same answer. And there's the limits of agreement. And this solid gray line, no, that's not the, uh, that's not the X axis. That's actually the mean line. The mean is like, you know, within 0.2% of each other. Um, but then you can see your, you know, 95% confidence is plus or minus, what is that, 8% or so. Um, occasionally, some people will be different. And then you have to answer the question, well, why are they different? Well, we know that somebody with a really high FRC can bang out really good power for 20 minutes. And if you use 95% of that really high power, uh, you'll end up overestimating their FTP. Um, whereas the uh, power duration model in WK04 doesn't rely on just a 20 minute effort, but in fact takes into consideration all of the data that's available to arrive at a, at a better uh, estimate. So that's it from a statistical perspective. Now, although some of this is going to overlap with uh, a little bit of stuff that Hunter pointed out, uh, I wanted to talk more about applications of the model, in particular, uh, and how it's been implemented within WK04. And as I was saying, this is a case where uh, I'm going to be throwing a whole bunch of stuff at you. And what you really want to walk away from this is not so much, well, how do I, uh, how do I use the model, but wow. There are a lot of uses for this model because there are a lot of uses and, you know, I keep thinking of new ones that I didn't anticipate when we started down this path. Um, so here's the uh, athlete details. Uh, chart really in WK04 that Hunter was showing you initially. Um, one of the first things you want to think of when you look at this though is we have our hero metrics up at top that Hunter pointed out uh, where you have the uh, Pmax, FRC, and model derived FTP uh, that WK04 has, has fitted to your data for the last 90 days. So this is always linked to the last 90 days worth of data as well as your set FTP. And the reason that uh, we've tracking, we're tracking model-derived FTP and set FTP uh, separately is because at the end of the day, a model is just a model. Um, and while it would be really nice to have an you know, automatic button uh, to push that model-derived FTP value into the calculation of uh, TSS, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we're not, uh, at least I'm not quite willing to, uh, to give people uh, that uh, temptation just yet. Uh, so we have them both up there. Um, another thing that Hunter mentioned were the individualized training levels. And if you look carefully there, we've now expanded from seven to nine. And unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast, that if you really want to chop up the power duration curve into reasonable bites, uh, it takes more levels. The first, uh, the first four are still linked to FTP as a percentage, and uh, the reason for that, if you look at power as a percentage of FTP, and these are for all the individuals in the database, you can see how 
the standard deviation, the differences between persons is very small at any reasonable duration out beyond a handful of minutes. Even all the way out, you know, to 37 hours, I think, is the longest ride. And it's really only here at the shorter durations that the individual differences really start to emerge. So we continue to link uh, levels uh, one to four, uh, and then of course the the bottom end of level five to the uh, to FTP, but then use the pot the uh, power duration model and certain features of this uh, of this curve in order to uh, calculate these individualized training levels. And then the other thing that Hunter pointed out up the top there was phenotyping. This is also based on the uh, uh, power duration model and using statistical criteria to objectively assign you uh, to one currently currently one of four phenotypes. So no more looking at you know power profiling chart and eyeballing it and saying, well, I think that looks like an all-rounder. No, I think that looks more like a pursuiter, et cetera, and just basing things off of five second, one minute, five minutes, and FTP. Uh, we're now leveraging the entire power duration curve and statistical methods uh, in order to objectively assign the phenotype. And while at the present time we only have four phenotypes uh, actualized, we actually have the potential to do many more than that. Uh, we've kicked around trying to do a uh, Briggs-Meyer type. You could have a primary phenotype, a secondary phenotype. Uh, we could report uh, the probability that you're a particular phenotype. You know, I always come up, you know, 97% T tier uh, aces. <laughs> Whereas Hunt, Hunter sent me one the other day with a nice uh, screen capture. He says, "Hey, I've defined the new the chameleon phenotype uh, because his his phenotype uh, is uh, malleable enough that depending on what he was doing or not doing on the bike, uh, his uh, phenotype changed." Um, So that's, uh, the, like I said, the hero metrics at the top are for the last 90 days, and you'll notice they're not normalized to body mass. If you want to uh, look at a different date, uh, you can do that. Uh, and if you want to normalize to body mass, you can do that. All you have to do is uh, download or set up your own chart. Uh, one of the things I promised from the get-go and pressured all the rest of the team was we needed to include the uh, uh, uncertainties of the parameter estimates. None of this black box, here's the model, here's the number, or people hiding behind an R squared value, which isn't value for a nonlinear iterative curve fit like this, uh, but instead to be able to, uh, to report all of the, uh, the parameter estimates. So this is my uh, PD metrics report here uh, for my comeback since uh, getting back on the bike in September after spending four months off with a, with a fractured vertebra. Um, and you can see the uh, Pmax 10.5, uh, standard error of the estimate, 0 0.2 watts per kilogram, uh, coefficient variation of 1.9%, uh, all the way out to giving you the sums of squares. Now, that this depends in part not only on the quality of the model fit, but also, I mean, if somebody has a 10-hour ride in there, the sums of squares will be higher than if you're like me, and I haven't ridden more than an hour since getting back on the bike. Uh, but we can report it. Um, And you know, if you want to look at it graphically, you can look at it that way as well. And Hunter showed this to you earlier. Uh, or I like to throw them both on the same chart. Uh, so now I can have my one-stop shop here, and I can see visually. I can uh, uh, assess the goodness of fit. I can see where the model deviates from the data, or vice versa, as well as look at the uh, the parameter estimates. And so this is uh, where I start saying WKO4. It's uh, it's the Burger King have it your way. Uh, so design the charts and, and set them up the way exactly you like. Um, so there are the same parameter estimates that you saw in the PD metrics report, only now they're shown on the face of the, the chart. We also have standards uh, as well. So Hunter showed this chart so you compare your curve to, uh, to standard curves and it should be obvious uh, where my strengths and weaknesses are based on the fact that I even fall below the novice range out there to at least one minute. Um, but since some people have a hard time, you know, those lines can run close together and uh, it's a log axis, et cetera, uh, there are other approaches as well. 
Uh, there's a PD profile function, which is an attempt to, to flatten the, uh, that previous uh, sigmoidal shaped curve. So if you were equally good at all durations, this would just be a horizontal line. Uh, but you can see it's not a horizontal straight line for me. No, I'm better at longer durations and I'm worse at shorter durations. Or here's one that uh, I call this the williams allen uh, Coggin score. Um, it was Kevin's idea originally to, you know, try and flatten the curve and make it more like the classic power profile chart in terms of how you interpret the looks of it. It was Hunter who said, you know, that's a really good idea. And then it was my idea uh, to uh, calculate it along the lines of the Mercier score that's used in running. Only in this case, we're scaling things to 100 instead of to 1,000. But the way you would incorporate in interpret your WAC score is that's basically uh, your power at a particular duration as a percentage of uh, the world class uh, lower limit. Um, so you could see that I'm about 40% uh, at one second and maybe I get up to what 55% at you know, longer durations. Uh, so I got a long way to go. Um, and then just for fun, uh, there's an age adjusted WAC score assuming that you fall off at you know, 1% per year starting at the age of 30, um, adjusts you upward and gives you credit for being an old duffer like me. Um, and if you don't believe that it's a 1% per year fall off, well, that's okay. Just change it to a half percent per year. You know, the power's in your hands. Uh, Hunter already showed you a PD history chart. Uh, I have one that actually now stretches back. I have 15 seasons worth of data. So it's kind of cool to see the variations over time, uh, but it also gets kind of crowded. So I did it a little bit differently, and I looked at my average best uh, PD uh, metric uh, per year, and then use the uh, the SLR expression to throw on a, a simple linear regression plot. And you can see I'm holding on pretty well with respect to my FTP uh, in that the yellow line at the bottom, it's sloping downward, but not all that much. But you can see the uh, the steady decline in my Pmax value and especially my, uh, my FRC. Uh, this is what happens when you, I guess, you have kids and stop doing mass start races. Or you might be interested in saying, well, you know, I mean, what's the relationship between that uh, FTP and, say, my CTL? So I was curious. So I set up this uh, FTP versus CTL scatter chart just for my comeback uh, so far. And you can see when I got back on the bike, my model drive FTP was you know, down around here like 180 watts. Uh, and then I started training and started building it up. I've gotten up to about 250, but now as I've uh, as I've continued to build my volume a little bit, my model derived FTP isn't going up anymore. Um, so I either need to increase my volume even more, uh, and I don't have the time at the present, or I need to stop, uh, you know, just uh, duffing around and really get after it and start throwing in some high intensity intervals or, or raise my uh, my CTL some other way, uh, given the time that I'm devoting to cycling, because right now I'm, I'm not training, I'm just maintaining. You can do other things with the uh, uh, PD model. Uh, here's a, a physiological report uh, where if you uh, apply a little physiological knowledge and make some estimates, you can estimate your VO2 max. Uh, and I see that do I have the units wrong there? I think that says watts per kilogram, and it should be mLs per kg per minute. I forgot to change that. Um, or my estimated uh, percent type 1 or slow twitch fiber area. And you can see I'm, you know, 65 to 71, and then dropping as I get older and older and older, and then, you know, more recently, not so good. Uh, so if I'm going to make my goal of, of a VO2 max of 60 at age 60 in a few years, uh, I think I need to get cracking. Uh, and stop just uh, muck mucking around. Uh, on the other hand, the percent type 1 fiber area, I mean, it's just an estimate, but nonetheless, these values are in the right range uh, historically by muscle biopsy, and I've had 42 of them, although not all for fiber type. Uh, I've always come up about 75% type 1 or so. Um, so there's a fun chart, but again, it's based on 
taking the PD model fit and knowing that that's a robust description of uh, your, your ability, is, is reflecting your physiology, and then from a little physiological knowledge, uh, estimating the underlying parameters. Of course, at the end of the day, you know, the best predictor of performance is performance itself, and it's the power that wins you the races, not you know the estimated VO2 max. Uh, but nonetheless, it's good for bragging rights. Well, all of that so far has been at the athlete level, I'm sorry, at the workout level, and that's where most of the applications of the PD curve will probably be found in that uh, the PD curve, since it's based on your mean maximal power curve, while occasionally if somebody does a really hard race, you might get a good uh, uh, indicator of their ability across a broad span of durations from that single event. Uh, generally, it requires you know, multiple uh, sessions. Uh, but there are also athlete level applications here. Um, the, here I, is a workout I did on the trainer and I started out, I was going to do some steady state stuff and I got kind of bored so I threw in some micro rolls, a couple of you know VO2 max style ramp tests, etc. So got a range of power outputs and the report I prepared down below just tells me what percent I spent in each of these individualized training levels. So then you start thinking about, well, wouldn't it be interesting to look at over long periods of time, or you know, a season or something like that, or several seasons, what is the correlation between the time you spend in, say, level five and your FRC? Or how does it correlate with the time you do level five, six? Or how does it correlate with the time you, do, you spend doing level six? So we can start to drill down and really understand what's, what's driving what. Um, so another interesting chart to, to prepare. Uh, and then here's, here's another one. Um, this is eleva elevation corrected power uh, in a more physiologically cogent way than anybody's been doing it to date, uh, but using uh, the power duration model. Uh, not very exciting in my case because, you know, I live at 124 meters and this was a trainer ride, so any variation in the elevation that you see in the, in the, uh, the parent chart here is just the drift of the barometer. Uh, in my Garmin or changes in the barometric pressure during the day because I wasn't going up and down any. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so I only get the credit for one extra lot because I'm only at 124 meters. Um, but this is a, an interesting tool to apply to people who do uh, climb up and down great distances as well. And it's again an application of the power duration model. So to sum up, the power duration model in WKO4, extensively tested, rigorously validated. Like I said, I've been beating on this thing for three years now, and it hasn't failed me yet. Uh, model the exercise intensity duration relationship. It is both statistically and conceptually robust, and therefore we can trust it as a foundation to do further calculations. And with that, I will stop here and I saw there were a few questions. I guess I'll let Hunter uh, moderate this. You still there, Hunter? <coughs> Unmuted. Hey, Andy, I am still here. Thank you. Yes. Well, great job there. And uh, I think we've got, we've been keeping up with most of the questions there. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that, um, you know, I think we're dialed in on, so hopefully, um, yeah, you're rock and rolling there, so no worries. Uh, let me get uh, my presentation going back up here. I think that, um, get hit that button and see if we got the right one. We got it. So, yeah, thanks. Sounds like a great deal there. You know, I hope everybody's enjoyed the science side of it and, and also the, the kind of the big picture. Again, we've got a... Um, a lot more education to come uh, and we're going to do the how to and what the features mean and go into teaching you how to use all of the software starting next week so uh, please let you know join us there as well and, and uh, we also have a tremendous amount of videos on YouTube so uh, that's a great place to go there one thing that uh, I also want to mention is the chart exchange um, you know you don't want the, the, all this complexity. You can benefit from other people. You can go directly to Chart Exchange. And Chart Exchange, you get to from inside your WKO. 
And so if you go to Chart Exchange up here in the little chart picker, I click the down arrow and click on Chart Exchange, and it automatically goes right to Training Peaks into the Chart Exchange right here. So uh, here are a bunch of charts. We've got started with this. We've got tons of charts coming uh, that we're going to share with you. And then uh, we're also going to make a lot of your charts available. So we're coming up with a process and a system that you'll be able to submit charts so that we can see those things. So that way uh, everybody can adapt from these. You want to see your temperature distribution by five degrees? Well, you click the install button and then it opens up the chart and you would see temperature right there if I had temperature in there. <laughs> Uh, he's an indoor trainer ride, actually. So let's do this. We'll uh, let's do it. Somebody I know that has uh, temperature in their data. Uh, I'm pretty sure Marcos does. So uh, we can go in there. And now, once you've pulled that in, you click on Chart Exchange and you type in temperature, and then there's the temperature chart right there. And instantaneously, you've got a chart that somebody else built in our community, and you're now looking at it. Uh, with basically not a single, uh, any brain damage at all. <laughs> so uh, Chart Exchange is really cool. You guys are going to love Chart Exchange. It's a great place. Don't worry. We're going to let uh, Andy put all kinds of great things on there too and uh, all kinds of crazy equations and, you know, time travel and wormhole equations and stuff that he's come up with. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. L another thing I want to let you know about is how to get the latest build. Okay, so we're updating the software daily practically right now. So it's important that you update every day or whenever you can because we're fixing bugs like crazy. So uh, we're working really hard. How do you get that latest build? Well, over here in WKO4, up there at the very top, you can click on WKO4 that it will come here to check for updates. And it will look for updates, and there's where you'll get it. So currently our build is 153, so I'm up to date. So make sure if you don't have build 153, you need it. All right. And if you're in the process of syncing from your data down on Training Peaks and it looked like it maybe stalled a little bit, we fixed a problem this morning. And what you'll want to do is force quit it, update it to build 153, and that should fix that problem right away. We've got a tremendous amount of continuing support all throughout here. So that's going to be a, a huge thing as we go forward. 4.1, 4.2, all will be free. All the upgrades for the point releases on 4.0 are going to be free. We've already got our list of 4.1 features we'll be implementing, and then 4.2 will be coming fast after that. So we are uh, back in action and continuing to evolve and work with this analytical engine. Last thing we want to say is, uh, you know, WKO4 software. It's as simple and easy as you like it, but it can take you as deep as you want. All right, So that's the beauty of what we've created here. You can make this so simple and so easy to work with, but you know what? You can put the formula in for time travel if you want to and plot it. So we've got a great engine that allows you to do those things. We thank you so much. Our whole team does at Training Peaks. Uh, everybody here, this incredible team here at Training Peaks. It's incredible to me that this is happening. We've been working now since 2002, 2003 on this. Uh, and our hardcore WKO4 team thanks you. You know, we made it for you. You know, so uh, from Kevin Williams, Tim Cusick, Dr. Andy R. Coggin, and myself, Hunter Allen, we thank you a tremendous amount for your support over the years. And, uh, we really are excited to release this and, and hope you enjoy it because we made it for you. So thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a great night. We'll look forward to working with you in the future. And, uh, you know, just let us know how you're doing. We're here to support you. Thanks a lot. Good night.